You're up 30% in the first 12 months of opening your family office. You made a lot of this through value-driven trades at a time when a lot of people, including David Einhorn, uh, notoriously have lost a lot of money on value-driven trades. Where exactly are you finding value in the markets today, and how is this a compelling value proposition for you? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, Achilles combines private equity diligence techniques and network access to uh, liquid markets. So we're looking to generate a strong running cash yield as well as long-term capital gain. But we basically have a proprietary database that goes through hundreds of credits, lots of different names, and when the price is ready for us to act on that, we're able to do so. So I think it's a combination of looking at private equity style diligence, longer term investing, which is suitable for a family office, as you'd expect, uh, with um, you know, applied to liquid markets. So why is it that you, know, you spent most of your career in private equity? Why now are you looking to public markets? Why are you opening really what's a hedge fund after eight years? You, know, you spent the last eight years at Apollo. Well, I mean, it's, it's really for the benefit of our family office. I think that there is a gap or there's a, an opportunity in the market to apply private equity diligence techniques, longer term investing to the public markets, and you get a different outcome. Uh, it's early days, uh, so can't get too ahead of ourselves, uh, but it's been, uh, it's been promising. Is this the beginning of a trend, or at least maybe not even the beginning, but we have so many people coming up in private equity now that sort of get to a certain point and there's really nowhere else to go. Will more of them leave and go back into the hedge fund world or maybe start their own kinds of funds? I, I'm not, I don't know. I, I, it's difficult to comment on that. Uh, I can only really talk to my own situation. I mean, I think there are excellent opportunities in private equity out there right now if you're buying at below average market multiples, particularly if you're using deal complexity as a source of value. But I think it is true that plain vanilla buyouts uh, continue to be executed at relatively high average purchase multiples, often driven by cov -like debt. And so it's possible that returns for plain vanilla uh, buyouts could go down, um, you know, but I, I can't comment on a broader trend. Mm -hmm. You talked about that database of companies that you've identified already as being attractive at particular price points and, and other parameters. What are those parameters? Uh, so it's, ma it's mainly price, it's mainly value. Uh, it's looking to see whether those companies are going to exist in 10 years, 15 years. We're not really looking to trade within the year or two. We're really looking to generate long-term value. Uh, as I said, as you'd expect for a family office, something intergenerational. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's really trying to figure out uh, which of these companies is going to be here in 10, 15 years? What are they going to look like? Uh, and when can we get in at an attractive point that we can benefit from their long-term value creation and ideally get paid to wait as well if they're generating cash in the interim? But just to press that point, how do you know what companies will be there in 10 or 15 years? I mean, those kinds of parameters, what are you looking at? It's, it's very hard to say. I mean, I think you just got to look at how replaceable their products are, mm -hmm. um, you know, whether what the competitive landscape is, whether you can see someone copying essentially the same thing with a twist and being able to beat them or whether uh, like it's you know a company that you have six Apple devices in your house probably uh, it's unlikely that's going to change anytime soon. You know we talked about people leaving private equity shops to start their own shops but people are going toward a lot of non-traditional places. PIMCO for example hired Bla uh, John Sosinski from Blackstone. We've seen BlackRock hire people from Adia and all of these people are looking to alternatives and building their own private equity vehicles. How is that changing the dynamic? Are we going to see more of this and why are these non-traditional players hopping into a private equity market that's already red hot? Well, I, th I think it's very smart that they're looking at alternatives, and I think it will potentially you know, change the competitive landscape a little bit in the next downturn if you find the managers that you've mentioned, BlackRock, PIMCO, and so on, leaning into alternatives in a different way. They already do it today, uh, but leaning in further into a space that's, uh, you know, where there could be compelling opportunities, particularly in the next downturn, I think is a smart thing for them to be doing now. Right. You had mentioned once that they had al already been, by accident, um, exposed to private equity in the last downturn with the last, um, you know, with the illiquidity seeping in. So really, how does this, what does this mean for the traditional private equity players like BlackRock, uh, sorry, Blackstone, Apollo? Should they be worried that there's like a whole new set of competitors here? I, I don't think so. I, I just think there's room for everybody. Uh, I think it's just a very interesting development that these managers that have very large asset bases could be leaning into this sort of space. Um, and I think it's very smart that they're doing so. Do you see a hole in the market that will allow you to attract sort of longer term money, money that you know can be locked up for a while and, and if so, where from? Where do you hope to attract money from? 
So we're, we're a family office. And, For now, you know, right? But uh, you don't intend to stay that way. So, well, I, I can't speculate on future plans, but I can see that our kind of strategy could be applicable to others who are looking to generate wealth through generations. Um, but I, it's very early days, so uh, right now the focus is on maintaining and sustaining performance. Can you give us any insight as to what successes you've had so far? Because as we've reported, you've had a 30% return in the 30%. There have been some good successes there. Uh, anything that you can divulge? Well, we're really looking to generate singles and doubles uh, and the occasional home run rather than you know, swing for the fences on every trade. Uh, so there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of names, but as a private fund, I really can't tell you the names. Mm -hmm. What I can say is that sectors that we found attractive, uh, for example, are in financials, insurance, some areas of technology, uh, some areas of media and telecom. So it's quite diversified, but it, you have to get down to the individual name to be able to, to say that's the right one and that's the wrong one. What about also, you have part of your strategy in public equities, but you also have a pool of money that's going into private equity. And we've seen so much money dive into the asset class at this point in time. What does the future look like here? Are valuations a little too high to find any success? Well, I think it's very situation specific. I think if you are a manager that is generally buying companies, good companies, uh, at below average multiples, and if you're looking, as I've said before, at complexity as a source of value, that's a, that's a smart thing, that's an attractive thing. I think for plain vanilla buyouts, it'll be interesting to see what happens when the refinancing cycle changes, when the credit default cycle changes. Uh, you know, then capital structures will have to live with higher rates. And if you're in a plain vanilla buyout that's financed with relatively high leverage, you may not be able to get the same terms in the future as you can get today. And that could create dislocation. And in turn, that dislocation will create value for people who are looking to put money to work in private equity in the next cycle. So, uh, you know, I, I think if you're buying things at attractive prices today, that's great. And I think in future, if there's dislocation and you know how to do it and you're prepared for it, uh, you know, you, you'll probably benefit from it too. How do you view activism in these stocks? We've seen so many records you know, in, in stocks and in indices in general over the last while, and it does feel like some of the bigger successes have come from when activists have got involved and maybe even piled in on top of one another. Is that part of your, you know, parameters? So I, I, don't, I don't do much of that, but I do think it can be a very positive thing. And if you look at the firms, very good firms, that have had great success in the space, I think that's only going to continue and it'll probably help to further create shareholder value. So in general, and of course it depends on the situation, you know, I think it's been a positive thing.